Good morning, everybody. Thank you for coming to our session and now plunging into darkness. We appreciate uh, everyone being here. I am David Gushy. I am currently serving as the president of the American Academy of Religion. And as president, uh, we do a few things besides go to meetings. One is that we get to pick a theme. And the theme I picked this year uh, is religious studies in public. I think I, the subtitle was the civic opportunities, responsibilities, and risks facing scholars of religion. And then we get to organize uh, a few panels. And, and so this is the first of, of three that uh, I've had the privilege of putting together. It's called Religion Journalism and Religion Scholars to 2020 and Beyond. Uh, and we're gonna explore two basic types of questions in the one hour that we have. One is um, about how religion journalism is doing these days. And the other is about how AAR scholars can most effectively interface with uh, religion journalism as it exists today. So I would like to introduce our, our panelists. They are laid out in alphabetical order. So that's how the structure is how it has turned out. Um, so very brief introductions. Um, Elizabeth uh, Dias. Boy, I am never going to get that right. Is uh, good. Uh, currently a national correspondent for politics and religion for the New York Times. And uh, when I uh, initially uh, extended the invitation, Elizabeth was serving uh, for Time Magazine. So we welcome Elizabeth. Lori Goodstein is a national religion correspondent for the New York Times and has served there for 20 years or more. Emma Green is the current managing editor for the Atlantic Magazine, where she covers policy, politics, and religion. Jerome Sokolowski, most recently, was editor-in-chief at Religion News Service. And I believe you were the one who recruited me to be a columnist uh, back in the day at Religion News Service. Niraj Waraku is a reporter at the Detroit Free Press who often writes about immigration, religion, and poverty, and has been writing about Arab American and Muslim issues for 20 years. Jeremy Weber is the deputy managing editor at Christianity Today and has published widely elsewhere. Uh, would you please uh, give a warm AAR greeting to our journalists? So I am now going to sit down and just pose a few questions and we'll see where the conversation goes and hopefully there'll be a chance for our audience to ask questions as well. All right, and anybody can answer this in whatever order. I, I envision a very informal conversation. Um, and here's the first cluster of questions. It's about you and your world, which is always interesting, I think, to talk about oneself and, and what you do. So what is the current state of religion journalism in the U.S. right now? What, if anything, has most clearly changed in the last couple of years? And are you satisfied with the state of the profession? Have fun with it. Jump on in. All right, well, I, I might start because I... Um I did a little research. Um, we have, religion writers have our own organization. Um, it's called the Religion News Association. And um, it's run by Tiffany Stanley now, previously by, uh, well, she's, uh, she, uh, sorry, McAllen now. Thank you. <laughs> I go further back with her than that. It was just corrected. Um, but. Uh, there was a little counterintuitive information that she gave me because the bigger picture is that you probably all know that um, the news industry is in big trouble. Um, it's kind of like working for the steel industry right now. Um, there are new, what's called news deserts all over the country uh, where small and medium-sized papers have just gone out of business. And uh, that's now about 20% of uh, you know, the papers that existed before, and that's just newspapers, about 1,800, um, you know, of those 
organizations have gone out of business, and so that means that there are no, they, many of them used to have religion, dedicated religion beat reporters. So that's, you know, that's a big loss, and those are the locals, and the way news works is the locals kind of feed, um, feed up the chain. Um, you know, the wire services look at what the local papers have. The national papers look at what the, you know, what the wire services have, and television takes from all of those. So, um, the, you know, the news business, uh, loss of journalists um, is, is tremendous in this country. And yet, so this is the counterintuitive from the Religion News Association, our membership has remained pretty steady, which surprised me, about 300 members. Um, the composition of the group is changing. It's not so much people who um, are hire work full time for a news organization. We have a lot more now freelancers. We have a lot more people who write just online. We have people who might do religion and. But all that's just to say that there is still quite a bit of health uh, and interest and vitality in this beat. And that can't even be said for a lot of other beats. Um, so you all have people to work with. I would, I would go a little further and say that, um, just to update David, David's uh, bio, that said, uh, when I, since I left uh, RNS in April, I've been working at uh, National Public Radio on Morning Edition for um, the past couple of months. But since I left, a couple organizations have approached me to ask uh, for, about how they can expand their religion coverage or even create uh, religion news networks uh, nationally. So I think there's definitely an interest and a, a recognition that religion coverage is important out there. Yeah, just uh, extending upon what uh, Jerome and Lori was saying, um, there was a few reports this year that came out a few months ago uh, that said that 36% uh, of newspapers uh, have laid off staff just within the past year since 2017. So that's not including all the layoffs before then. Um, and you know, newspapers really are at the heart of American journalism. That's where the bulk of the reporters come from, and they're the ones that are breaking news. So when you have decreased staff overall, it does affect uh, religion journalism. I know at the uh, Detroit Free Press, about a dozen years ago, we had four people on staff who were interested in and would cover uh, Muslim American and Arab American issues. Uh, now there's just one. So it does affect uh, religion coverage. Um, but I think one of the issues is that, so what's replacing that now is a lot of more partisan uh, and agenda-driven uh, reporting, you know, and that's, you also see that with the rise of social media, with Facebook, um, the problems with them, with creating news that's misleading. Uh, and so the, the key is how to do religion reporting in a nonpartisan, uh, fair and nu nuanced manner, uh, because those voices are decreasing and you're seeing more uh, polarization um, with these sort of ideological sites that have come up. I, I do think um, there's a sense in which that phenomenon cuts both ways. Uh, so speaking from a national magazine that has in some ways gone the opposite course of these regional newspapers, uh, in recent years we have gone from being not profitable to profitable, we're now going through a major staff expansion, uh, we're sort of in our own mini golden age and I think other publications like ours are as well. And one of the things that I see happening at peer publications, other magazines or uh, organizations at this national level that are sort of writing from that 30,000 foot is a sense that the things that uh, do attract attention both online but also generate a lot of interest and buzz around our print editions are some of those issues that are quite contentious that maybe have a partisan overlay but that we can write about in a way that is not fundamentally partisan or biased. And religion is uh, chief among those. I think uh, when I started writing about religion at the Atlantic a number of years ago, there was frankly shock that there was actual interest and a market case for having someone doing this type of coverage. And I think the, the lesson there is that despite all of the structural changes in our industry, in the aspects of the industry, the places in the industry where there is expansion and there is growth happening, religion I do think is seen more and more as something that's essential to have and that people are willing to put staff against. Yeah, I guess I would jump off of that, also uh, being at a, a national uh, magazine. Um, I started my career at uh, my, uh, my local newspaper, a typical like, um, you know, small daily in northern Indiana. Um, 
And yeah, the challenge with, you know, when journalism was only on print was it's, it was hard to measure what exactly was read and which types of stories were bringing people to the paper. Um, but I think while definitely the business overall has had challenges with like uh, staffing and revenue, uh, you know, we're all here because we care about uh, you know, the topic of a religion um, and the move towards all the stories being online and be able to see the really clear metrics on that, not only just clicks, but also like shares. Uh, it's really clear that religion content is a very popular driver. So um, I know, um, yeah, I went from my newspaper, I was at a, a trade group of about 1,200 small and medium-sized dailies across the U.S. Um, again, at the time, that would have been a very difficult case to make, but now that everybody's either going online first or, again, everything is both print and online, that's much clearer. Um, so at one level, um, yeah, the, the, the staffing is definitely under a challenge, but the reach has never been uh, bigger. So, uh, for example, we we reach about like 120,000 people in print every month, and that's been pretty consistent for uh, almost a decade. Um, I'm doing about like five million uniques online right now, uh, which has also been consistent for about three, four years, and like a third of those are outside the U.S. So, I could never say take my publication and like profitably print it and ship it around, but I have a chance to be a part of you know, improving the religious literacy of communities all around the world now, just not just in my local uh, market. So. Um, for example, uh, one of the big religion stories over the past month was when the Pakistani uh, Supreme Court, um, uh, they acquitted a woman named uh, uh, Asya Bibi. Of, she was on death row for blasphemy. Um, so when that, uh, we had a chance to be a part of breaking that story because I happened to be in uh, Singapore at the time. Um, so I had like 75 people a minute like in Pakistan like reading that story in addition to my like uh, American readers. And so I had a chance to be a part of um, the local community, learning about the ruling, what were some of the key quotes that were, uh, you know, deep in the judgment, because I read the whole, you know, 65 pages and like pulled out the money quotes. Uh, that's something I never could have done before this pivot. So kind of like, I mean, it's cheesy, but it is kind of like the best and worst of times, uh, depending on which aspect of journalism you're uh, looking at. I think I would just add that even though there are a lot of challenges in the industry overall, Whenever I hear sort of general bemoaning on social media from uh, readers that, um, you know, where are all of the religion reporters? I, I just think, oh my gosh, we're all right here. And you guys, do you know how good all of my colleagues are? I mean, the, we might be small in number, but I would just, I'm so encouraged by the depth of the work that my peers do at all, at all these publications that ones that aren't um, up here today. I mean, think I think of the stories that have been broken. I mean, there's so much news in uh, religion, and not just religion on its own. I think increasingly religion is understood as religion and fill in the blank as a beat. And so while the structure might have been in the past, you know, you have a uh, solo reporter covering just like institutional religion, the way that uh, I know our, my colleagues are thinking of stories and editors are receiving them. It tends to be really integrative, and I'm imp I'm really impressed um, by by all of that. Frankly, I mean the the the, the tone setting. I me, mean, I think of you know Lori's story this summer on Cardinal McCarrick. I mean breaking that that just like game change. We're in a whole new phase of understanding. Uh, what's happening in the Catholic Church and society as a whole uh, on sexual abuse, how we understand that. Uh, I mean, that's just one out of so many. Uh, so it, there's a ton of work, and I, I mean, journalists in general, we're all overworked. Um, but, <laughs> but I think we, um, I, I would just encourage you that we're on it, and we're trying to be on it, and we can't do everything, but... Uh, there are, there's just so much good work being done um, out there right now. I've been struck by what seems like the constant churn in this, in this industry. Uh, for example, Washington Post has an on faith column or section and then it doesn't. Uh, be there's belief net and then they're gone, I think. Uh, there's, um, you know, up and down, uh, uh, a place, uh, Huffington Post religion is big for a while, and then it's not. Um, it's hard to know um, what's going to be there uh, from one year to the next. From, uh, you know, if, if you're a religion scholar and you're going to invest in an outlet, 
will it be there a year from now? So is that just the news industry right now? Is that corporate America? What's going on with that? And by the way, you want to get closer to the microphones probably, I think uh, that'd be good, thanks. So interested in your thoughts on that. I think a lot of it has to do with the management of the publication you're with. Uh, if there's an interest in religion, they'll promote it. Uh, if it's not, then it could change uh, depending on uh, you know who's in charge. Um, so that plays a, a role. Um, but I think uh, if there is uh, an interest in the in the management, it helps. But if not, then it can be it can disappear like pretty quickly. It was interesting to me the sections and websites that you named were almost all associated with new media with maybe the exception of Washington Post which now actually does have a next gen version of On Faith, uh, Acts of Faith which is run by colleagues of ours who are, are wonderful. Um, and, and I think there's a lesson there which is in the internet media ecosystem there are many initiatives or uh, verticals that are proposed, put into action very quickly, and then quickly taken down. And this is not just about religion. Y you know, for example, uh, BuzzFeed, one of the sort of preeminent of the, the newsy online uh, publications, they invested very heavily in podcasts and then roughly two and a half years later, unilaterally laid off their entire podcast team in a day. So this is sort of the reality of new media generally, and I would say religion is one, one feature of that. And to flip that to be more constructive for academics who are interested in investing in relationships with publications or who are interested in having those platforms, I do think there is one form of continuity which is around people. Uh, so people who are interested in cultivating those freelance relationships with people who have religious expertise are likely going to continue with that interest if they have the capacity to. And similarly, everybody up here, uh, we're all people who've had bylines that are sort of floating from place to place in, in the religion media world. Uh, so those kinds of relationships I think are gonna be more consistent than necessarily banking on being an unfaith columnist for X number of years. And just jumping on that, there's an element of flexibility that uh, at least I'm still learning in this industry, but it's very different from the academy. I mean, I went to Princeton Theological Seminary for grad school, and if, if the mantra in journalism right now is just iterate, you know, iterate, figure it out, see what works. I mean, we're trying, as an industry, we're trying to figure out what's going to be sustainable in the long term and how we fund ourselves, right? So there's a lot of experimentation there, and that mindset is just uh, very different from how projects get created, I think, in the academy. So I would, I've uh, been trying to learn to be more flexible about that, too. All right, well, let's switch gears and um, talk about AAR people and how we can be of most help. Uh, AAR, for a long time, has been a resource for uh, reporters and uh, people who are thinking about uh, religion and journalism. Uh, we've recently revised our mission statement to incorporate advancing the public understanding of religion to uh, a shared place with fostering academic excellence in the study of religion. and so. So uh, we haven't figured out what the, yet what that's going to look like, but that's the, that's the idea. Meanwhile, probably a lot of the people in this room um, think that they've got some things to say that would be helpful when there's a story on uh, this or that issue about religion. Call me, call me, and you know, don't forget, I'm, I'm over here, I've got some stuff to say. So here are my questions on this. Uh, when you do your reporting, to what extent are AAR-related scholars top of mind for you as sources? And uh, what can religion scholars do who want to be, who want to be helpful and who want to be noticed and who want to contribute to the conversation? And then I'll ask some follow-up questions. I'll, I'll answer the, the second question um, because I, I haven't been doing re actual religion stories uh, lately, more editing. Um, but I would say there, there are two things. One is um, that you want to respect the narrative of the journalist. We're telling stories. Uh, I might say true stories, and you, uh, these stories have to be told in, in, a, in a certain way. Um, you want to work with us, especially like uh, when I've worked in television or now in, in radio, um, stories often go from scene to scene, from place to place, and so you want to uh, go and 
be part of, go to the location where, where someone is filming or go into the studio. Try to be as flexible as you can so that you can work with that journalist to help them be able to tell their, their story. And uh, by all means, try to avoid your office. Don't have a camera crew or people come into um, have you sitting at your desk with you know plaques in the background? You want to be on location, and um, I th think that would be my main main advice. Well, I, I have one really simple thing, which is that um, journalists need to hear from you immediately. Um, yes, <laughs> I mean it's really simple. But y when now I'm talking here more about reporters calling you and I think there are other things you can do to um, get your work to reporters so let's just focus on when when you're being summoned um, it takes uh, first of all you have you know you may get a phone call it may be by email it may be by Twitter DM um, if you really want to be you know um, want to be in the mix you have to be you have to make yourself available um, but the other thing is to kind of try from the, when the call first comes in, to try to discern what kind of story the reporter is asking you to help with. And there are different, ki there are different vehicles. I mean, what Jerome was talking about was kind of a, sounds to me like, you know, a pretty long-term enterprise television or radio documentary. I mean, I'm, I'm mostly in print, and I see kind of three, uh, categories of th things that you might be asked to do. One is, um, is sort of lowest common denominator, I'd call it paint by numbers. Um, and that is that the reporter is on a very tight deadline. Uh, it might be a daily breaking news story. They have seen your name um, somewhere as an expert in whatever it is. And they may even have seen that you've written, say, an op-ed or something, so they know you have an opinion. They might be calling you to repeat what they've already seen because they know in their paint-by-numbers they need someone to give a commentary that's sort of like this. And that's why I call it paint-by-numbers. Paint um, I mean, that's a little more crude than it is because a good journalist will ask an open-ended question and not a question designed to route you into a certain direction, but I'm being honest, I mean, this is, you know, we are often called to write entire stories in the space now of two hours. When I started uh, at the New York Times, our deadline every day was 6, 6.30. Now our deadline is 10 minutes ago, uh, because you have to get that story up, especially if it's breaking news, immediately. Um, and by the time someone's calling you, they're probably, we're probably growing out the story a little bit, trying to provide a little bit more background and context, but that doesn't mean it doesn't have to be fast. So that's the first category. And the way to, you know, find out, ask the reporter, like, what is your deadline? How much time do you need from me? And if the answer is, I need 10 minutes and I need to talk to you in the next half hour, you know you're dealing with that first category of story, okay? The second category is more, you know, mid-range. Mid um, you know, maybe they have, maybe it's 10 in the morning and they can really file by, by 5 o'clock. And in that case, the reporter may need a little bit more um, context. They might need to also be testing the um, assumptions of the story. Is this a first time ever thing? Um, has this only happened in Denver? You know, is it national? Is it international? Um, so hopefully they're asking you for your, your expertise and you can have a little bit of a longer conversation, but still it's tight. Then there's a third category of story, which is more like, you know, I, I guess what we call a deep dive. Um, and hopefully, you know, you can ask the reporter and they will tell you, I have some time. I'm really looking into this. You are one of the first calls or you're the tenth call. I mean, you can ask the reporter this. Have you talked to other people? How long have you been working on this? You can ask questions to try to suss out what kind of a project am I working, am I being asked to participate in? And then, you know, and then make your decision. The thing is on those deep dives, you should know that, um, you know, it's uh, many times you can be asked to give quite a bit of your time. I mean, I have done hour or more than hour long conversations um, with, um, you know, many scholars and probably some of you in the room to whom I am very grateful because you have helped to shape 
the work, but it doesn't mean your name is going to show up in the story. You may inform the story, you may not be quoted, and you have to know that going in. It's kind of a, you know, an act of grace, an act of um, generosity to, <laughs> to help a reporter like that, and yet, it's really, really important because you might help disabuse us of the very trajectory we thought we were following or the frame of the story, and yet it's thankless because it is true that you may or may not be in the story. The stories tend to be, especially these days, as Jerome was saying, scenes, characters. So as the scholar, unless it's a really rare case, you are usually not one of the characters. You are context, you are background, you are the richness of the story that you're providing, but you may not be the face, you know, the face in the story. So I'm telling you this so that, you know, for those, I mean, some of you already know this about journalism and how reporters work, but there's different kinds of vehicles. And, um, you know, you have to think about what you want to be available and participate in. We need you to do them all. <laughs> we really, I mean, I can't tell you how much I depend on religion scholars. I did not go to seminary. Um, and even if I did, maybe I would have expertise in one thing. You know, I'm, we're, I, I think many of us are like, we're asked to cover the whole waterfront. It's impossible. So we, we can never do that without you. So I would hope that you would, you know, respond when, when people call and not, not be wary. But also, you should be more informed about how it is we work so you're not kind of you know, taken by surprise. Oh, I talked to this person for an hour and they didn't quote me. Or, oh, I talked to this person and they only seem to have one question. You know, but try and know why that is. There's reasons. So I'm sorry for the long answer, but I wanted to, you know, I, I really, since you asked us to do this, been thinking about what it is, how we can engage better because I think it's so important. I don't think I could have said that any better. <laughs> it was really, really um, helpful. So, my, my other thought here is I don't know how this conversation plays out in your workplaces and at your universities and in the academies and the, the groups that you're a part of, but my general sense as an outsider there is that sometimes at the academy there's this, n there's mixed messages about how scholars should or shouldn't engage with um, I wouldn't even say public theology. I would just say like with the news media and like what value um, public writing has to scholars' individual careers and how that is or is not rewarded in terms of seeking tenure or um, any kind of the normal rewards uh, that happen in your own profession, right? And so I'd I would encourage the, you all to maybe have more kinds of conversations or seek those out in your own workplaces and see, because I think some of this is structural probably, like how will the, how will your university, um, what, what kind of engagement does the university want its scholars to have with the news, right? What happens if you take time to write an article? You know, one of my dream fantasies is always every kind of, um, big academic paper or book that you guys write, I would love to see a 300 word little nugget of what is that, how does that connect with whatever the news of, maybe not the day, maybe that's too much to ask, but like how does this connect to the, con the conversation that people are having, you know, at the school parking lot or at Starbucks or whatever, or like with what's happening with politics. And there's probably a lot more kinds of connections like that with your work, but because the demands of the institution seem to be different, I feel like we maybe lose out on some of that. So I would just encourage those conversations to happen um, on your campuses and see, I mean, some schools are really proactive. I can name a couple that are, that they have really amazing comms departments that when you need something, you call them and they will have a scholar on, you know, what what is the, the history of religion in this county in Colorado, right? Like they can do that for you really quickly, but most often that's not the case um, or, so there's just a lot of ways I would think that this could be explored um, more immediately where you are as well. Just to build on what Elizabeth and Laurie were describing, um, you know, Laurie really powerfully described the way that we need you, and I think that's very true, and I have a, a thing to say about that in a moment, but 
I also think in a certain way, um, we can be a tool for academics. I think this is probably the idea, the driving force behind this mission statement that you were describing earlier, David. We are essentially, for better or worse, gatekeepers of public knowledge, the public conversation, whatever ambient thing that is that people talk about when they're talking about the public sphere. Most people encounter ideas primarily through news magazines, newspapers, television, and that is the platform or the space in which conversations about ideas happen. And I am a firm believer that the academy is this wonderful thing that we have here in America, here in the world, where people are allowed to create knowledge, to do long-term research, to really have depth and expertise. And I think it's horrible, the idea that that would be maintained within silos, that those conversations about academic work would only happen among academics or in college classrooms. So in certain ways, I think there can be a nice symbiotic relationship where we do need academics to inform our work, but also we can hopefully be a vehicle for you all to communicate things that you care about, to be shaping that public sphere, so-called, to get the conversation to a place where it is more sophisticated and does have more nuance, and hopefully good journalists will be able to work with you to do that. And in that spirit, I would say that my experiences with academics um, speaking on the phone for background or for quotes, I've always been most grateful for people who find the perfect balance between patience and condescension. Uh, <laughs> And what I mean by that is, uh, sometimes, depending on the topic of a story in particular, I feel a little bit like I did when I was a college student many moons ago, when you're sort of grasping, you know the question you want to ask, but not quite how to put it into words. You know there's something there, but you don't know exactly where it is. And I've had academics who have very, very generously been able to understand, to listen generously, to pull my questions out, to draw me in the direction that I seem to be wanting to go, and I've loved that. that that to me is the sign of a good teacher, um, and, and I think that is the perfect patience exercise. I think it can go too far to the other end. I have academics frequently on the phone telling me things that I definitely know because I'm a professional religion reporter. And um, I think trying to, to find that balance in your own hand as an academic, not using a call with a reporter to give a lecture or to have a 15 minute discourse on whatever pet topic you love, or to start maybe too basic. Sometimes that can be a hard thing to suss out, and I do think the difference between a professional religion beat reporter versus a generalist who's been assigned to cover whatever topic can be a world of difference, because when you're talking to that professional religion reporter, you don't necessarily have to explain the difference between a sermon and a homily, or talk about the difference between a Protestant and a Catholic. Those are very basic things. Uh, you may have to do that with a daily news reporter who's maybe not on the religion beat. But that perfect sweet spot between patience and condescension to me is just such a gift. And I've been really, really grateful to academics who have been willing to guide me along as I've sort of searched for where that story is. Yeah, one thing that's important to uh, develop, I, whenever I get an email or a phone call from an ac academic, I prioritize that because I know that this person is an expert and has a certain degree of credibility. So I would encourage academics or uh, students uh, who are experts in these fields to contact journalists if you see them writing about these issues. Um, one challenge is to, one thing that can help is exchanging notes, so to speak. For example, whenever I report on issues, say, in um, minority religious communities, the academics may not be aware of it, and they're interested in that. Uh, so it may not be for a specific story you're working on. You can have that sort of exchange of ideas uh, that occurs outside the context of just writing a story. Um, one challenge is just finding out about things that people in academia are working on. I, you know, I remember there was someone who had spent a lot of years uh, studying the Yemeni community of Dearborn, um, and it was very interesting research, but I didn't know about it until she had already left the area. Uh, if I had known about it, you know, we could have written a story or it would been helpful. Um, and then there's also an expert on, uh, who wrote a book on the Shia American community, which I didn't know about until later on. Um, in other cases, there are some fields that academics are still not haven't reported on, uh, you know, as a journalist, I really feel strongly that uh, newspaper reporters should always try to write something that's new or different, not just rush to the hot story of the, of the day, um, and sort of trying to find that new detail uh, that other people don't have, even if it's something small. Um, and so sometimes academics can help flesh that out by offering context, um, or you can share it with the academic and they can offer uh, better an explanation for it. Oh, um, 
Yeah, I guess, yeah, to build off of, um, uh, yeah, so to reiterate the importance of like speed and then maybe a couple tips for how you could uh, help us find you uh, faster. Um, yeah, it is uh, you know, just an unfortunate dynamic where we all of us have a number of new competitors because of the move to digital who have uh, have lower standards than we do, um, <laughs> and so um, and you know overall we're we're proud of the information we've gathered. We want to be responsible with it, but because we do um, want to make sure our readers encounter our more professionally curated information, we have to move as fast as possible to try to head off all those lower quality competitors. So um, yeah, as like Lori mentioned, I mean I'll I'll lose. You know, yeah, I lose market share in like 10 minute like intervals. So, uh, one way we've come to mitigate that is right, maybe go up sooner with a uh, smaller story, but then we'll continue to pursue sources over the course of the day and keep augmenting it. Because um, a strange irony is, even if, um, even if say I go up with like uh, a story in 20 minutes and it's got two sources in it and it's like 300 words, and then by the end of the day, I've kind of done what I fully want to do. It's like an 800 word story, there's like six people in there probably 80% of that story's readership aren't going to come to it until it's essentially finished and I've added the additional voices and I've refined it. But it's that initial link, and because of the way that Twitter, Facebook, and other things work, that initial link will outcirculate all the folks who waited until 6 p.m. to then go up. So even if, say, you see my story's already gone up and I come to call you, the reason is I know I can still get your expertise in front of a ton of people. I've done what I need to do to get my shoe in the door, to have the the mind share um, on people's you know, smartphones as they're commuting or after they put their kids to bed. Um, it, it's just a strange dynamic where, again, like 80% of the readers aren't going to come until, a, a much, until the story's finished, but I have to go up as early as possible to, to be that like link. Um, so a couple of like concrete, uh, oh, and I also love, uh, I love those of you who are either like tweeting things we say or like following us based on what we say, because I can just see how, how dumb I'm sounding or how, you know, Smart I am, and uh, I'll have to find you, Daniel, after this. Um, so a couple, uh, a couple tips. Uh, so I take my notes on my phone, so I'm, I'm seeing these like pop-ups as we go. Um, so like related to that, you know, definitely, you know, the longer I've been at this a decade, uh, you know, many of my colleagues here have a long longevity in the industry. Um, you know, over time, we'll get to know your name, your expertise, and when you could become useful. Um, but on stories that we're coming to for the first time, we're looking for fresh voices. I mean, we're doing what anyone would do. We're going to Google, we're searching Twitter, Facebook, et cetera. So, you know, if you have expertise and you wish more people were tapping you for it, you should be uh, sharing it in public with those like key, like keywords in there so that I could encounter you if I was searching for your niche. Um, one way some academics have done this well is again, they've started like a blog somewhere where they kind of either preview what they're working on, they kind of give, I mean, there's a range of ways to do it. Some people give little summaries of what their lecture was that day. Some people, you know, oh, hey, I was just commissioned to do a book on this topic. And they'll kind of, you know, give uh, previews at the chapters. Um, so, uh, you know, that's one way I can follow a subject matter expert. Um, individual blogs can be a bit laborious. So there's definitely been a move towards like group blogs over time. Um, for, for example, for my purposes, since we have a focus on Protestants, um, I follow a blog, it's called The Anxious Bench. Uh, it's on uh, Patheos, and um, it's basically a gathering of like Christian historians who uh, they kind of, you know, they roughly each post maybe like two or three times a month, um, but then they have a group of about eight to 10 like people, and so that gives their blog the consistency to kind of have a niche in the market, but none of them are individually on the hook for too much, you know, again, content separate from your classes and your book projects, et cetera. So, I will regularly, um, you know, find someone there having given commentary on a recent current event and referenced either a book. Maybe they did a book five, ten years ago. I mean, it's still useful. There's still an ep expert on it. Just I wasn't aware of the book when it came out. Um, or, um, you know, for example, there's a guy. Uh, it's Howard Friedman. Um, he has a blog. It's a uh, Religion Clause. He basically um, just, you know, simply notes all of the uh, church-state uh, cases that come up through the court system. Um, over time, one, he keeps me informed of that particular beat. I get to see his expertise on the subject matter, and then I know to elevate him on my source list whenever I have, in that case, a church state question. Um, and then the other piece of advice I'd give briefly so we can you know, get to questions. Um, you should like pre-write most of the op-eds you would ever want to publish, but you shouldn't like pitch them until current events have uh, made everyone want to have this like hunger, okay? so. Uh, I mean, overall, I mean, uh, I, I've never met a journalist who wasn't like hardworking and like really diligent, but we, we are a little like 
uh, uh, like proud, okay? So we don't want to be your free PR. And if you come to us, it was a really hard sell, like out of nowhere, I've got this op-ed, it's on this topic, it's super important, and you must publish this. Um, you're going to get a no from every outlet you go to, either because one, the market isn't demanding your expertise, or two, you're, you're really trying to get me to do the work of promoting you. That's not my role. Um, however, definitely when current events happen, all of a sudden I have a need, like I, I have a hole to fill, I need to fill it hopefully with something intelligent versus something silly. If you encounter me then, and you're like, hey, by the way, I've got like 800 words of expert thought on this, um, you're much more likely going to get a yes. And so the people I've seen, um, say for example, um, you know, the wake of the uh, shooting in Las Vegas, um, there's an author, his name is Max Lucado. He had done a book related to, um, um, man, I'm gonna figure, it was it, 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 like anxiety, anxiety, worry, like fear. Um, and it was really clear that basically what his uh, publisher was pushing was, um, again, an op-ed which had been kind of like, uh, had been curated from the book. Uh, I forget if it was an excerpt of a specific chapter, but they waited essentially until the next like mass shooting event. They dropped like four graphs on the top that directly tied it to it. And then the rest was, um, again, his, his like discussion from there. So um, I'm pretty sure that ran in USA Today if I'm remembering. And so, again, I, I wasn't there. I didn't talk to them about this, but my, my bet is that was pre-written and just waiting for the right time. So, um, you know, again, if you've had a book come out, if there's like knowledge you wish was shared, uh, you know, uh, you know, maybe aim for roughly, you know, 800 to 1,000 words. Uh, have it written, but don't pitch it until current events mean the public want to know about it. Stick three graphs on the top, I'm not gonna know, but you're gonna meet my need and you're gonna get published much more uh, frequently with that strategy. Thanks so much. Real quick follow up. Does maintaining an active social media presence, does that matter to you all? I mean, are you paying attention to social media? I'm so ambivalent about social media right now that uh, I'm in a withdrawal mode because I think it's so ill. Overall, social media strikes me as so ill and dy dystopian right now. But anyway, talk about whether social media is, a, is something we should be investing our time in. Yes, is my answer. Um, I follow what I think of in my own head as a cohort of young, hip religion scholars who are on Twitter and get where the news is and also understand how to contextualize their research and expertise with the news cycle. And I can't tell you how many times that's been my go-to or someone who I've you know followed and seen uh, and know could speak in this idiom of the news and understand how to make their work relevant. So for me, being able to communicate, not only that you know something about the topic at hand, but you're someone who understands how the news works is definitely part of my selection factor. Yeah, the more uh, rancor and uh, anger there is on social media, the more uh, I think a positive role academics can play. I mean, I really, Looking, like looking at the Twitter feeds of, uh, you know, whether on the conservative side, Professor Kidd or, or another a liberal side, Professor Butler of UPenn, just to name two to come to mind. Um, so I do follow them a lot, uh, academics and experts on religion. Um, I think one thing, though, I've noticed that social media has decreased my outreach to do interviews. I used to quote scholars a lot more, and I was, uh, would do a lot more interviews, but with social media, there's a decreased interaction on sort of a one-on-one -on -one level um, and I don't know if that's played a role in my, me relying less on scholars, to, um, just looking at the Twitter feeds. So it can be distracting in a way if you let it get out of hand, and uh, I understand the concern that some have, that, some have with, uh, that it's become a little bit too much. I, um, AAR used to maintain um, a, a website. I don't know, do you guys remember? It was, I think it was called Religion Source. Who remembers that and how long ago it was? And, uh, David had told me that the funding for it dried up, My but um, if it if there were any way to get that going again, it was a website that primarily I think aimed at journalists. But um, I think any I think you had to sign up to use it. But you could put in any keyword, and it would spit out uh, the, not just the names of the the scholars, but also their publications on the topic and how to contact them. So you could see you could really narrow down like who might be the best person to talk to. And you know, I went to that for you know stories on Rastafarianism and um, you know tithing and I mean really obscure stuff. And found people that I would never have known because they were not writing op-eds. It's just that this is what they dedicated their their careers to. 
Um, so something like that was a great tool, and I used to tell other reporters who were not religion people, I used to tell other reporters about it because they would come to me and say, hey, who do you have on this? And I would say, I don't know, here's this website. <laughs> so um, with that having disappeared, there is something else you might want to know about that, again, is run by the same organization I mentioned earlier, the Religion News Association, and it's called Religion Link. Um, these are sort of tip sheets on uh, pr burning, burning issues and topics, and they're usually very, very timely. Like I looked today to see what they have up now, and there's something on uh, religion and marijuana. Um, what else? Ethics of gene editing. Um, children and religion, you know, stories other than vacation Bible school. Um, but anyway, those, uh, you know, give ideas for journalists who cover religion or who are generalists who want to cover religion. And at, besides listing sort of, you know, um, uh, other publications that have been written on that topic or things you should look at or f ideas for stories, at the bottom of those, each one of those, is a whole list of scholars and their contact information. And, um, you know, if you go on, if you look for Religion Link or you go to Religion News Association, look for their website, you can find the editor of those, um, who is the religion reporter at uh, the Deseret News, Kelsey Dallas. And so you could even suggest, why don't you do a Religion Link on this, you know, and include me, by the way. But because AAR, uh, AAR's uh, website doesn't exist anymore, I think a lot of people have, have turned to those. I know, I, I think a lot of people use those, use those tip sheets. All right, well, let's, oh, Jerome, do you want to get in? Yeah, David, I yeah, just go ahead. wanted to say that I, I really share your qualms about social media, but at the same time, uh, and I avoid it, I've confessed that I've avoided uh, being on there a lot myself, but uh, when I'm looking for guests to book for Morning Edition, often I'll go to, to social media and see, you know, who's been tweeting or commenting on the on the latest news story. It kind of shows that you're you're up on the things, and and, you know, that's kind of, you want to be, you want to sort of be savvy about the different kinds of journalistic mediums there are out, out there and uh, know how to um, speak on them. I guess we have to decide, each of us, whether we're in that game or not in the game, right? I mean, and it's, it's up to us, right? All right, let's pull the lights up and see if we can get maybe 15 minutes of questions. Um, so if people would line up at uh, the, the microphones, which are... Um, on both sides, and your challenge is to ask your question in no less than 25 words. <laughs> okay, not a lot of commentary, just go for the question and we'll start off. Can we over. answer in more than 25 words? Uh, you have 13 <laughs> words to answer. All right, so let's start off on this side. Yeah, I'm pretty sure you meant no more. Yeah, that's good. This is for uh, particularly Emma and Jerome, if I may. Um, 25 years ago, I spent an hour and a half with Cullen Murphy at the time editing The Atlantic, talking about a project on the philosophy of the resurrection of Jesus. Stephen Davis from Claremont was running a conference of analytical philosophy in New York City. So we were checking a number of boxes, right? Claremont, good school, New York City, you know, center of the universe, um, philosophy, that's kind of public. And I said, w The Atlantic will run thought pieces on theories of economics, theories of politics, theories of music and art, what we should be doing, would it run a think piece on whether the resurrection of Jesus can stand as an intellectually interesting idea? Does it deserve, in other words, public conversation? And if over an hour and a half, I couldn't convince him that it was. And his main answer was, our readers don't really want to read about that. That was 25 years ago. Can we have substantive conversations about religious subjects, or do we always have to write about what those religious people are doing? See the difference? Rather than writing about what those religious people are doing, can we have actual substantive arguments in public yet, or is it still not interesting, or actually too interesting, and probably a little dangerous? Okay, thank you. Yeah, this is a really interesting uh, epistemological question, or I guess editorial framing question, which is, is the role of a magazine of ideas to compete uh, views against one another about the truth of XYZ topics, specifically when it comes to some sort of first principle truth about the nature of God or Jesus or whatnot, 
or is the role of a news magazine to help people have an entrance into a world where those things are being debated, to understand the stakeholders on either side as though you're in the bleachers and you're watching people playing a basketball game where two sides are sort of competing against one another. I think The Atlantic in particular sometimes plays in both modes, but just to be frank, I would say our posture specifically around some of those first principle questions would almost uniformly be bleachers, not on the court itself. Um, and that's for a whole variety of reasons that we could get into about secularization in America and the way that we think about uh, knowledge that's acceptable to be sort of debated in the public sphere and all of that, which I, I'm sure would be a fun cocktail conversation for anybody in this room. Why else would you become a religion scholar? Um, but what I will say sort of in defense of that modality, I think there is enormous value in having a really good bleacher view because the vast majority of people won't be able to find traction in a conversation debating whether or not, you know, the, the divinity of Jesus or whether or not God exists. They might be interested in it, but I don't know that necessarily people want that to be happening in their Atlantic. But I do think that people want to understand why people care about those questions in the Atlantic. I think they want to find conversations that other people are happening that are surprising or curious to them. And ultimately, I see it as my role um, being someone who can sort of be a tour guide uh, in, some, in some forms, that's my job, is to help sort of show these worlds where these conversations are happening and for someone who doesn't know anything about them to come away with a decent understanding of what those conversations look like. And, and I would just say that it, as an editor and formerly as a journalist, my, I am ultimately accountable to my, my readers or my listeners. And if they're interested, I mean, they are often most interested, at least at the publications that I've worked, uh, they're most interested in what are those people doing. But if you can make a compelling case that they should be interested in something a little more cerebral or philosophical, then why not? All right, let's see if we can get one more question in on this side. Uh, I have a friend in uh, Phoenix, Arizona, who is a religion editor and did lose his job um, at the local newspaper. But I was always the, the go-to person uh, for any of the stories or things that he was telling. And I would often ask him, um, why aren't you telling a story about this? Why are you seemingly always telling a story that creates controversy or uh, has a very high... Uh, profile thing, and he said, well, precisely because of that, it's not uh, controversial uh, enough. In a time when so much is being said now about fake news, uh, I saw that uh, video of uh, these t sessions and two uh, pastors getting up and kind of quoting back scripture to Jeff Sessions at the thing, and I posted the video and had a friend say, that's fake news. And I went, oh my God, it's a video. I mean, how much more truth can you have in actually seeing it? How, how do you deal with that in terms of posting things about religious questions that may be controversial and trying to speak the truth when people don't seem willing anymore to listen to what truth is? I think we just keep doing the work. I mean, uh, fake like the fake news whole problem is enormous, and the lack of belief in or and trust in truth that it exists uh, is a huge problem. Uh, and you know, I think organi news organizations are trying to create new ways to combat that. Uh, and you know, we are going to get very soon into an age when it's not just, you know, can you believe this video? Like, look, there's a real video of this. Like, the next thing is deep fakes, and they're going to be, you know, crafting videos. So you're not going to, you're going to, it's going to look like some public official or anyone saying something, but it's doctored, and you're, and it's going to be their voice. It's going to look like them, and it's going to be fake. So this is the environment that we're headed toward. And I think really right now, all, all I can really do and like where do you find your space in that like you have conversations with your peers as an organization you figure out what you're going to do in that and then you just keep telling the truth like I don't know that there's another answer to that okay let's see if we can get one more question in okay thanks 
Can you hear me okay? Um, uh, the Religion News Service uh, just received a nearly $5 million <coughs> check from the Lilly Endowment, which will allow most of it is going to be going to Associated Press to expand its coverage. Half a million dollars is going to the conversation. I think Atlantic has received funding from the Lilly Endowment too, I think. Um, but do any of you know of any examples anywhere where individuals, people, whether they're subscribers, whether they're members, whether they're scholars, whether they're clergy, are willing to pay for religion news because that's its long-term uh, path to viability. <clears throat> the only, and the second thing I do want to just ask you about is that we're in an unprecedented time, at least in, in my own history, in terms of the media being called the enemy of the people and some of the horrendous things, I don't know that the general public or even religion scholars are aware of some of the horrendous anti-Semitic, and uh, Islamophobic kinds of things that political reporters, for instance, receive. I wonder if you could just briefly comment on your perceptions of this moment in time, what it feels like to be a journalist uh, pegged as enemy of the people. Um, yeah, let's be real. I'm glad you brought up the conversation. I meant to mention that earlier. That's a good site which is already trying to aggregate scholars and help interject you into the current events media stream. So you should definitely check it out, the conversation. They've got a specific religion vertical and many of you might find it a helpful um, way to get involved. Um, we're at least, we're making pretty good money off of our, um, uh, essentially one of the main reasons you would pay for an online sub is to search our 60 years of like archives and so I'm personally not worried about trying to get people in their 20s and 30s to like to pay for like news, but as long as I can own the like 40 to 60 year olds, folks who wherever they are in their profession, they now have a need for credible niche research. Because uh, for example, two thirds of that, those five million uh, monthly readers I mentioned are mobile. None of them are paying for news, but it's like the desktop users who are paying for the subs. And those are clearly people who are probably like later on in their career, they come in on a current events thing, they see we have a story on a niche topic that they're researching and they want to pay to get access to it. So we're actually making pretty good money off of that. Um, but again, uh, check out the conversation, you'll uh, benefit from it. Um, your second question is a very important issue. There's definitely been a rise in hatred and uh, Islamophobia and anti-Semitism and I think that affects journalists too when you're writing on these sensitive topics. Um, you know, I and other journalists do get, you know, hate emails and and phone calls and there's concern about security now among journalists, you know, the free press now has hired a security guard, which we didn't have before uh, after the newspaper shooting in, uh, in Maryland. Um, so that's always in the back of your mind. Um, Islamophobia has been there for a while. Uh, you know, even before September 11th, I remember there was a lot of anti-Arab sentiment. Um, and so that's, those are things that affect uh, journalists and how they operate. Um, uh, but I think that, uh, the, the thing is to have open lines of communications. I mean, I think, you know, the conservative, the relationship between media and the conservative Christian community is kind of a delicate one. Um, in the past, I used to write a lot about, more about the evangelical community and the conservative Catholic community. Um, not so much in recent years, it seems like, you know, the, the community there has moved more towards a political uh, angle in terms of supporting Trump, but I know a lot of other folks have done really good work in recent years, um, uh, like Elizabeth has done some Good work on that. Um, but the important thing is to keep the lines of communication open. If people feel that the media is the enemy and they don't reach out and then both sides get into these hardened positions and uh, that really doesn't help uh, you know, the general society. Well, we are out of time, which is heartbreaking. Um, but in the spirit of the last question, I would like to thank our journalists and the other journalists who are here with us for what you do. Thank you all very much. <laughs>